back in the video band for Unit 9, I learnt something about the maths of rhythm and the beat in music with this band, Betty's Kitchen. Well, today I'm hoping to find out why each musical instrument has its own characteristic sound. What exactly is going on that distinguishes a guitar from a fiddle? I'm presuming it has something to do with this jazzy little display here that lights up as the music plays and claims to be telling me something to do with the frequencies. Well, to be honest, I've always wondered what exactly a display like this is telling me. I guess it has something to do with how loud the notes are and which ones are low and high. But I'm hoping that Alan Graham, who I teamed up with last time, is going to make it all crystal clear. Right, I'm just going to give Alan a call on the mobile phone. Hello, Alan, it's Janice. Hello, Janice. Hi. I want to come around and talk to you about music again. That's fine. We've, we've got a gig tonight, but maybe you could join us at the rehearsal this afternoon. Great. All right, I'll see you later then. Yep, see ya, bye. OK, bye. Sheila, I'm just going to take you down a touch. I played it all wrong anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try it from the beginning of part two. Okay. Two, three, four. Hi there. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, Hard to see you. <laughs> anyway, we're just about to have a break, so shall we just stop for a while? Yes. Great. great. That sounded great, Alan. Well, I've come for my music lesson and to hear the performance later, but can I start with basics? When you're all playing the same note on your instruments, each note sounds different. Why is that? Well, to understand that, I think you need to know how a note is made up. Let's take a very simple example of a tuning fork. Uh, when a tuning fork is struck, it gives a pure, simple note, a single frequency. And let's look at the trace that it produces. Because it's such a pure note, it gives a perfect sound curve. When a tuning fork is tapped, the prongs, or tines, have been designed to oscillate at a particular rate. Look at the behaviour of just one of the prongs. It starts at rest with zero displacement from the horizontal. Plotting the displacement against time gives you a regular sine curve. One peak and one trough together represent a single cycle of the sine curve. A fork that's tuned to middle C will produce a cycle 256 times a second. This frequency is often described as 256 hertz. So you've got this graph by plotting amplitude, that's the vertical displacement from the horizontal, against time. So does it matter how hard you hit the tuning fork? Well, uh... You might be tempted to think that if you strike it harder, the tines or the prongs vibrate more quickly. Well, that can't be true. This is a tuning fork in C. It will always strike C however hard you hit it. But if you strike it harder, and let's see what happens. And that's what it looks like when I hit it hard. You can see the yeah. amplitude has increased. So the peaks and the troughs are more extreme, aren't they? That's right. So strike it harder and it gets louder, but the pitch doesn't change. So the amplitude tells you how loud the note is? That's right, yeah. Tap the fork harder and the prong is displaced by a greater amount. You don't get a greater number of oscillations per second. What you do get are oscillations of a greater amplitude than before. 
Each of these sine curves has the same frequency. That's one cycle every 256th of a second. It's only their amplitudes that differ. So, Alan, if you change the note you play, how does that affect the trace you get? Well, you've seen the trace for the note C. Now, this blue tuning fork is tuned to A. That's the A below C, so it's a lower note. And if I hit that one... ..and just have a look at the trace... ..this lower trace is the one for A. And the waves are more widely spaced out here than they were with the higher note. The reason being that with A, the frequencies are less, so that they're more widely spaced. But there's no real difference in the amplitudes because I struck them both quite gently. So, in fact, the compactness of the waves tells us whether the note is higher or lower in pitch. That's right, yeah. This fork is tuned to the note A below middle C. As such, it's been designed to oscillate at a frequency of 220 hertz. This new note, in blue, vibrates more slowly, so its peaks and troughs are slightly more spread out, with one oscillation every 220th of a second. But, Alan, here you're talking about pure notes. What do these traces look like for real instruments? Well, let's hear a real instrument. Maura, if you could play us two notes. First of all, play us uh, a soft A. Certainly. And that's the trace. Now, a loud A. Well, they're a lot messier, aren't they? They are a lot messier, but there are some common themes. First of all, there's a regular repeating pattern. But secondly, the soft note had a much smaller amplitude than the loud note. So what's all this messiness about? Well, on a real instrument, when you play a note, it's not just the note that you play. That sets off a lot of other notes called harmonics. So what you're hearing is the fundamental note that you have played combined with the various harmonics that have been set off. And how can you tell what these different frequencies are? Well, uh, it turns out that the frequencies of the harmonics are exact multiples of the frequency of the fundamental note. Here's a demonstration. It's like a big version of a fiddle string. There's a motor at one end which jigs up and down to set the string vibrating. At a certain frequency, the string forms a steady wave. This occurs at the fundamental or first harmonic frequency of the string. Doubling the frequency of the motor gives you the second harmonic. At three times the fundamental frequency, you get the third harmonic. And so on. So I can see there are different harmonics, but how do you know how much of each harmonic there'll be for a particular instrument? Well, it's pretty hard to separate them out from the sort of graph we've been looking at. It's very messy. But there's another way of representing that information. You can separate out each of the harmonics and represent each one individually on a different type of graph called a frequency spectrum. But with a frequency spectrum, instead of having amplitude against time, you have amplitude against frequency. Here's the waveform graph for the pure note C at 256 hertz, with amplitude plotted against time. You can represent the amplitude of this note in a different way on what's called a frequency spectrum graph, by plotting amplitude against frequency. A frequency of 256 hertz can be represented as a point on the horizontal axis. The height of this spike on the graph then represents the amplitude of the note of that frequency. Now, here's the waveform graph for the note A. It shows two differences from the previous note. The pitch of this note is lower than the last one. So, the frequency of 220 hertz is at a point on the horizontal axis that's slightly closer to the origin. 
this new note also happens to be quieter than the previous note. And so, in this case, the amplitude at 220 Hz appears as a shorter spike on the graph than the spike at 256 Hz. So this is the waveform of the fiddle and this is the corresponding frequency spectrum. And you can see this is the spike corresponding to the fundamental note and all of these are the various harmonics. And you can tell how much of each you need by looking at the amplitude there. That's exactly right, okay. yes. And you could do that for any instrument, but this is the characteristic shape of the fiddle. If you like, this is like a fingerprint of what a violin sounds like. So I've always wanted to play the saxophone, and I see you've got one there. So breaking it down like that, I could go away and make my own saxophone sounds. Yes, why don't I play you a note? Take it away and that's the fingerprint of your own saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> 